thanks. I will take over the screen share. Oops, where did the window go? Always so we have already okay. put in two questions or three questions about motivation yeah. and what what our kind of wish list or what we think or what you essentially you think about documentation, what should be in there. So important. Okay. Um, I think it's um, it's kind of expected that um, the best documented projects people have seen are really big projects. So they are things where you don't want to go through the source code and try to understand what it's doing because it's so big. And also they are aimed at um, an audience who doesn't necessarily um, need to know all the details of the thing that, of, that the package is doing. Um, so, oh, oh, you know, just need a one small piece. Like in scikit-learn, you usually don't use everything that scikit-learn has because it has a lot of things. Um, so PyTorch is really big. Um, scikit-learn is really big. There's NumPy, SciPy. Um, Pandas, okay, yeah, Pandas is a bit, um, I often have to go and actually find stuff in the documentation to use Pandas and it often helps, um, but that's true. Um, I think pan pandas can be a bit complicated. Flutter. I'm not actually sure what Flutter does. Do you know that? Uh, no. Um, oh. And then, but yeah, Tidyverse is really... Yeah, sorry. Uh, Tidyverse has... Um, Tidyverse is good at enforcing good documentation. Um, yeah. in, my, in my experience, it's not necessarily that big project means good documentation, actually. Um, it, it's it's more active use by a lot of people, which um, uh, or active use by a lot of interested people, who then yeah. also recontribute re a bit. Doesn't necessarily make um, all big projects mm -hmm. having a good documentation. Yeah, that's a good Especially point for details. Um, so if you've ever actually so that there is a built-in documentation thing for the GNU operating system or the like all of these um, all of these things you can run in uh, Linux for example the commands like ls and uh, cd and so on and um, it's kind of a choke uh, a running joke that those are almost unreadable um, but they do have all the details. <laughs> so um, yeah, being something, being a really big project doesn't guarantee that the documentation is, is especially good. Although it kind of does guarantee that there's a lot of it available. Um, so someone might write a tutorial who's not even involved in writing the code. Um, but yeah, so I guess my point is small, uh, small things used by a small number of people don't necessarily need so much documentation. Um, and you kind of have to decide what level of documentation is appropriate. It, it depends on who is going to use it. And um, it depends on how much time you have <laughs> and a lot yeah. of other factors. Well, at the same time, um, a small project that has little documentation um, can still be well documented. Yeah, if um, it's a small project, it doesn't need as it doesn't have as yeah, much to document because it's also not so, that complex. And you it, yeah. it's easier to just grasp what it's actually doing. Yeah. Okay. Um. But yeah, I don't know what Flutter does. Um. But if you wrote down something that you think has really good documentation, then there's the question: um, What actually makes the documentation useful? Um, what makes it good? Um, so that's the second question here. Um. Of course, what makes it important? Well, um, actually, uh, not a huge number of answers. Can we think of some more? Um, uh, well, OK, it, it's important for uh, for it to actually be for at least anything that's more complex than a, a few simple functions uh, to be actually useful to someone else. Yeah. Um, if you don't have any documentation and everyone needs to read through your code um, to understand what it actually does, then it's very likely that people just won't use it. They will have yeah. a look at, okay, there's some code, I don't care. 
Um, I, I have no idea what it does. Um, I don't have the time to go through the whole source code. And this um, applies to you yourself in the future. So yeah, um, yeah. If the future is important, yes, that's a <laughs> that's a good answer. So um, you, if if you go back to your code, even if it's a really like short, simple code that has only three functions um, or three main functions, um, when you come back to it in three years, you're not going to remember what those function names are, and it's much nicer if they're mentioned. Uh, in the documentation somewhere you can quickly see. So rather than that you have to go digging through the code to figure out what you need to do or how do you need to call the functions. So it is also useful for yourself. Okay, so what is good documentation? How would you describe useful documentation? Um, it helps I, you understand the code. It, helps you understand. Helps you it gives you modify. examples on how the code is being used. So that and uh, yeah yeah okay so a really good point so it helps someone else use the code in without them having to ask the creator so if it's code that you wrote then people don't have to always come and ask you right if they can <laughs> you you can offload some of that work to uh, the documentation um, of course it you can never write perfect documentation so there will always be some questions and some things will just not be correct but. Um, it's much better than having to always show people how exactly how to use it for everything. Um, that second point to me is, well, clear engaging not too long. Um, not too long is a, a very relative um, thing, but I think that yeah. mostly applies to the initial readme, uh, which is only some part of the documentation. Uh, yes, you shouldn't put useless information or repetitive information into, the, into your documentation, but I, I'm not sure if I would agree with the not too long in general. Well, I mean, well, too long okay, is always. Yeah. They, they you can always make something that. too long. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, can you can you add information that's actually relevant and make it too long? Um, I think it's possible. Like at some point, it's easier to to just read the code. Um, so at, at some point it's no longer useful um, but also it, it is important to structure it so that there is this like the first page you see something relatively short that tells you what the software does um, something like a readme and then there are tutorials that tell you how to do the things that the software is designed to do and then for each user facing function at least it, it, it's function that a user could need um, there's some uh, description of how to use it and what it does. I, I would rephrase um, that uh, for every function that you intend to use it to use. Right. Yes. Um, it's also good like, if, if you want to, um, if you have the time, it's very good to have documentation for all the functions that nobody that, that you never expect any user to use because of course someone will be developing the code might be you might in three years or might be someone else. So um, it is good to document everything um, at least a little bit. Um, I think the third point is also quite good with um, having uh, examples that actually help you to get started. So yeah, which yeah. is the tutorials that you mentioned um, is, and the, the points here generally are good. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Um, and yeah, they yeah the, the last it. added point is actually something uh, easy to navigate. Yes, um, easy yeah, for you to find point. what you're actually looking for, which which is really difficult. Um, that, that's probably one of the most difficult bits, uh, in my opinion, because a good structure is not easily found. Yeah. And if your code is growing, then it's very likely to get messy structure wise at some point. So okay. Yeah. Um, how, so, but, how do you motivate your colleagues to contribute to, to the documentation? I'm. I mean, I. The first point is they explicitly say it's meant as a joke, but I'm not going to take it seriously because the best way to motivate someone, especially like if you're developing something as a job, if it's part of your job to develop software for research, actually paying people for spending time on it would be a good idea. It's it's not. 
um, something we always do very well, but it, it is actually a very good way of motivating people, uh, actually pay them for their time. Um, but yeah, um, there are other ways um, as well. Um, so yeah, explaining why it is important, explaining why it helps them in the future and helps get their work cited. So it helps other people use the code and for researchers, citations are, are the kind of uh, important. So um, if other people can use your code, then they can also contribute to your field and um, mm. yeah, help you in your career as well. And what, what I think is important, um, both in an academic or non-academic setting, um, if you have undocumented code, it takes a, a lot more time for someone else to get into that code. Yeah and might even be impossible yeah so uh just docu documenting saves money um if you want it like that mm. or in the academic uh instance um keeps knowledge it because saves you time so... and it saves your research group time in yeah. the future like, uh, there, there are so many non doc uh, there's so much non-documented code around uh that is essentially okay well this was done by a PhD, master student, whatever, um, last year, and he's gone. If you're lucky, he answers to uh, to emails. If you're unlucky, he doesn't. Uh, at which point, it's I have no idea how this works, um, and I can't can't understand the code. So this is dead. This is dead upon the person leaving the leaving the group, and might even have been dead before. That. Last point being added is is yeah true very important. So we have talked about how to cite software and how to like, how to make sure that the people correct people get credit credit for software. Documentation is part of the software. It is an important part of the job of actually doing the research and getting to a result and publishing the software and publishing the paper and all of that. So. The, a person, someone contributing to the documentation it really should be looked at someone who's who, I'm spending, actually spending time contributing to the research project. Um, at least if, if, if we are at the point where we can actually talk about citing software, then definitely someone who writes documentation should be included in the authors for that software. Okay. Well, yeah. I think that is quite a good piece of information and yeah let's head to what should documentation actually contain yeah so um should we we basically covered everything in the um in the first section but um i just want to quickly show what we're going to do in this lesson so um in the first half essentially will be a uh discussions about documentation and then how to write good readme files. And then this, in the second half, we'll go through a demonstration with um, a slightly more uh, complicated documentation than readme files and how to, um, how to you, uh, get that viewable online, how to deploy it on a, on a website. So um, let's go to the motivation section and feel free to answer, of course, in the notes, even though I'm not sharing them right now. Um, so why documenting code is essentially done. Um, yeah, so let's talk about that. So yeah, what should a good documentation contain? Should we, let's wait for a moment before we start throwing around ideas, give people some time to talk, well, we uh, to, collect to write. What we had um further up what just how would you describe useful documentation true there we can yeah so there are some some points that that go to that section so um Okay, so the arrangement should be boring. So um, yeah, it, it should contain the things that you expect it to contain. Um, 
which is installation instructions, some quick start, um, how to, so these are tutorials on how to do a specific thing the code is intended to do, and a reference, which means, um, I guess we'll get back to it, but um, some documentation for almost everything in the code, but like in a structured way, so that you don't get, uh, you can find what you're looking for. Since it's written down here, I think we should mention a bit what an API is, because I assume we will come back to this. Yeah, well, we cannot avoid using the expression yeah. in practice. So yeah, API stands for application user interface, no, no, application programming interface. Programming interface yeah. So it's basically everything yeah. that you use from an application, from a piece yeah. of code. Um, so all the functions and their signatures, i.e. what parameters go into the functions and so on. And this is in programming something that is, well, named very, very often. And um, also web services uh, commonly have an API where you request, uh, you request certain endpoints um, with specific queries. Um, so essentially it's um, everything that, if, if someone is using your software, if they can easily see or easily have access to something, then it is in, in the application programming interface. Um, all the functions that are visible to the user, all the classes and so on. Okay, so we have some, um, we have some good answers here. So let's start digging into it. Um, and uh, we also have our own wish list for documentation. Um, so let's look at the answers here first. Um, it should, okay, it should have a link to the code. It, it should explain to you how, how to install the code. Um, that's also mentioned here. So yeah, how, how do you to install it? How to get started? Um, how to do, and then uh, how to do some uh, basic uh, things that the program is meant to do, that the software is meant to do. Um, then it should contain some examples, um, which has a number of votes. So yeah, um, so once you get started, um, it, yeah, it, it is good to give people an idea of how you expect the code to be used. And you can do that with examples. And it, I would also add tutorials, which are kind of like examples, but a bit more detailed. Um, so they tell, you, tell people um, in clear steps how to achieve a specific thing with the code. And that, that's, of course, always something that you have intended software to be used for. Um, but then when you go a bit further, so um, one thing that's not here, there's no front page or readme, is there? Um, so, uh, so it would be good to have some, oh, well, there is this, what is the purpose of the thing? We kind of guess at that. Um, what, is, how, what is it, how to use it, how to modify? Um, so there should be a front page and a, a readme. Um, a readme is kind of the front page of the code side of the thing. And then there's a front page, the documentation itself. And those should give a really brief 
um, overview of what the code is for and answer most of these questions already. Um, and then, yeah, then there's the API reference, which is um, documenting essentially everything when you're trying to call a specific function and something goes wrong and you want to figure out why it went wrong, then you want to look at the API reference. Um, so you want to document essentially all the functions that are there, at least to some extent. Okay. How to contribute, that's important. And uh, how the others want the problems to how how the others want problems to be reported, how to report problems. So yeah, um, that's also a good thing to have. Um, how you should describe how you would um, or where to uh, where to report bugs, where to report issues, or where to report or, or where to discuss about features that you would like to add or would like someone to add to, to the software. And, and then gen in general, how contributions work. Okay. So, so here's our checklist. It, it's mostly the same things. Um, so you would want to have in the documentation, you would want to mention the authors of the software. The license uh, purpose is something already mentioned. Um, how it should be cited. Is useful to have. That's also in the citations file, of course. Um, and then some examples where you can, or tutorials, how to get started, dependencies, um, installation instructions is important. The reference documentation was already mentioned. Um, yeah, and how do you want people to contact you? And some uh, frequently asked questions section. But this is roughly. Almost everything was was there in the answers, so that's a good thinking. Um, we roughly have the same ideas. Okay, um, we do have um, in the next step kind of a list of popular tools and solutions. Uh, let's go there. Um, we will go over some of them in more detail, mm -hmm. and. I think uh, the only things um, we really want to mention here for these tools and solutions um, are the formats that we commonly use to create documentation or which is mainly markdown and restructured text. Okay. Um, right. So, well, yeah, okay. We have a whole section on in-code documentation, um, which basically means the documentation that is embedded in the code itself. Um, and then I think in the next section, we'll have readme files. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk more about that. Um, so yeah, uh, Markdown, you already know because the collaborative document is in Markdown. I was going to just open it and show, but it's so. Uh, you, you, you can, if, if you're looking at it, you can see it. So this is Markdown. Um, yeah, and restructured text is another option. So can you, do you want to say more about why use either one I of them? The, well, uh, the one, the biggest reason is that it's a relatively simple format. Um, it's all text-based. Uh, so you, or, it, well, yeah, it's all text-based. Uh, so you can easily put it into version control and see differences. So it's not a binary format um, where you get a big binary dump of the data. Um, but you can actually follow what change what changes were made. Um, it has most features that you that you need for having a nice looking or at least online document. Um, and yeah. So I guess, I mean, they look a bit different but they have roughly the same features. And I guess restructured text, because um, it is what Sphinx uses and Sphinx is very commonly used to build documentation. It might have some features more, like some features are, are there more uh, by default, um, whereas in, in Markdown, you might need some um, expansion plugin, something like that. Um, 
one thing is that there's a like markdown is maybe a bit simpler it's maybe a bit faster to learn but um it is not a big difference it's a very small difference um but there's very many flavors of markdown unfortunately so uh some syntax that you use on say github readme files might not work in, in a different place so yeah there's um and there's multiple flavors that implement, for example, equations. So uh, they might do it slightly differently, unfortunately. But um, the, 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 the standard, um, the text formatting things generally work the same way. Um, yeah. yeah. So we'll, in, in our example, in the next, um, second, well, not the next section, but the, the next hour, we'll use a uh, mist flavored markdown in Sphinx. Um, but you have to, you can, you can use um, essentially whatever you want in Sphinx. And of course, Sphinx is not the only thing out there. And there is a list of other static uh, HTML site generators yeah. um, on this page as well. So feel free to have a look mm -hmm. at that. But really, the the main thing, the main reason to use Markdown or our restructured text is that it is text. So um, you can version control it, and you can use it with your source code very easily. So yeah, we will use Sphinx, and one reason is that it is actually what we use to build this um, course website. Um, it's very commonly used in Python projects, but not limited, of course, to Python. Um, it is itself, it runs in Python. Um, there's plenty of other options and a lot of these use Markdown. Um, I guess that's probably enough. We <laughs> uh, probably all we want to say about this. Um, Sphinx has a built-in thing for API documentation as well. Okay, let's head on to yeah. encode documentation. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, okay, wikis are another popular option, but they don't exist as text in your um, in your repository. Um, the advantage is that it's pretty easy to start editing it. You don't even really need to learn any new language, um, even though Markdown is an easy language to learn. Um, but yeah, it is not connected to your repository, which is like, the main big downside. Then later is very common and that produces PDFs. Um, the advantage is that it's very popular and um, people in certain fields know how to use it. The disadvantage is the PDF format. Um, it it makes a it has some restriction has some restrictions on how you can use it. Um, it is not easy to turn later into a website, although it is possible, and it's not easy to automate building it, although it is possible. Um, so it gets a bit more complex. Um, Oxygen um, is, well, you can use it for, it's very popular for C++. You can use it again for API documentation. So it's kind of like Sphinx, uh, it's just another option. And here's some other tools. Um, they kind of seem to go with certain languages, but in, in principle, you don't need to pick um, a specific one based on what language you use. It just depends on the community. Okay, so in code documentation. So anything that's inside a, um, a source code file is in code documentation. Um, and it's probably the first thing you do, maybe after the readme file. Um, so when you start writing code, it's good to already start including some documentation in the code itself. Um, so let's take a look at these two comments. Um, wonder how much should we go back to the notes even? At, well, let's say, um, let's paste something into the notes. And um, okay, it's already there. So um, yeah, which one is better? What's um, what is useful about either option? Let's just do a vote. Um, you can write down some comments below, but yeah, um, vote for option A or B.
So what makes comment B so obviously better? Maybe this was too obvious a question. Yeah, um, this is a pretty obvious question. Um, well, comment A only only says what's plainly written there already. Yeah. Uh, there's no additional uh, additional information obtainable from comment A. Is comment B wrong on purpose? Your car temperatures below minus fifty as measurement errors, and this checks if it's larger. Yes, if it's larger than it, I don't actually know if it's. Just, I don't uh, think it, it was on, on purpose. purpose but but um, yeah, <laughs> you're right. Now we check if so. This one actually doesn't. If if you just have this and then this line of code, um, it, it doesn't actually tell you that it's wrong. But here you say why you want to check if it's bigger than 50, minus 50, and um, that's a measurement error. So yeah, now you know that the code is actually wrong when you just, you know what it's doing, what it's doing. It could so well the, be on purpose, actually. <laughs> so the comment definitely is useful because you, yeah, yeah, just spotted the bug. Yeah. Is there anything here that uh, we didn't mention? Not really. No. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, and um, there's some some situations where people often use uh, comments where having version control is actually a better option. So sometimes you see people comment out a piece of code, and you know for testing that's fine. You sit, you comment it out, you run it once, and you see if what you're doing is is working. But you, it's then not a good idea to just keep it lying around in the code um, because when you remove a piece of code and you commit it to version control, commit it to Git, um, the code exists. Or if you have previous before removing it, if you have committed it to Git, the code exists in Git and you can get it back. So there's no reason to keep it also commented out in the code. It just makes the code harder to read. Um, and this is not even the worst thing. So if it's at least commented out, um, it's not looking as if it were uh, it's normal code. But I've also seen things like if zero. Okay. Yeah. Or if false. Um, yeah. Um, to comment stuff out. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. Um, <laughs> but it's usually to force. So, for example, if it checks for a file and then creates one if it doesn't exist. I might force it to delete the existing file and overwrite it by uh, doing that um, when developing. But yeah, just keeping that around in the code is not a good idea. It makes it less, uh, it makes it harder to read. Yeah. So yeah, another one is emulating version control. So you, um, a comment that tells you why you, that tells people why you changed a code, a piece of code is, not really that useful, or well, that's what version control is meant to do. That's why you write a comment for each commit that you make in in, in Git. Um, you tell people why you're making to change. So you don't. It's not necessary to make those um, in the code as well, or in the comments. I think what's important with um, these kind of in code the in code comments is that they explain things. They they don't state um, state what's happening but they explain why things are happening um why are you doing th uh, these kind of things and so on and there that's where these kind of inline comments have become useful but yeah and then there's a second type of um in code documentation yes so this is more about the api documentation yeah. uh or there was already a question um, a little bit further on and uh, further up in the in the in the collaborative document about ah, it, right? Um, and this is, I think, the answer to that question: What should be in a doc string? Um, in general, yeah. What what's going into the function? What's coming out of the function? What does the function do? Um, so that your what whatever kind of API uh, documentation generator you would be using can pass this in uh, or yeah can pass this and create a nice looking documentation out of it. Um, yeah. And the better uh, structured for whatever parser you use 
it is, uh, the more or the better it the better it is for the for usability in the end. Yeah, so it it is actually very common to see um, the comments take more space than the act than the actual code. Um, even though this is a relatively a constructed example, um, it's also relatively realistic. So it it um, it is useful to tell uh, how you're converting uh, between Fahrenheit and Celsius um, in this function. I think and what is the expected input and output? Mm. Yeah, and it is actually a, a, ha just having this line of code. Uh, inside your code is less descriptive than calling this function. So it is a, um, yeah, this is a good example. This is how you would do it in R, just occasionally change from Python um, for variety. Okay, so um, yeah, so doc, doc strings can, like they do more than just comments because you can pass them out into this documentation. Um, and so, so you can automatically generate this API documentation part of your documentation, which is very useful. And what that really means is that your API documentation lives with the code. It, it exists in the same place as the code. And you, well, that makes it more likely that you will remember to change it when you change the function. Um, so there is no separate file where you have all of your API documentation. It is in the same file as the code which is very useful. Okay, so a good doc string will describe what the function does. Um, what are the input variables and what are the outputs? Um, what format is the, are the input yeah. variables? So yeah. what types? So essentially how to use the function and yeah. why, uh, what, what is it doing? Okay. Oh, and one, yeah, very good point is that the name of the function is also important for documentation. So here the function name tells you exactly what it's doing. And that is important. Okay, so then finally to readme files, um, let's go over this section and then have a break. Um, so readme files are kind of the, the first, well, I. I said that you might want to first start when you're starting to write the code, you might want to start with um, in code documentation of uh, some kind, but then readme files are the first thing that a user would see and uh, that anyone you share the code with uh, when they go to the, um, when they get your code, the first thing they look at is a readme file. And if it's um, on GitHub, GitLab, something like that, then it's in a nicely formatted section on the front page of your code. So it is the first thing people see. And it is, I think it is very important to have. So it, it you should always have some kind of a readme file. Um, it might also be enough um, in a small enough project to put everything in the readme file. I would agree. Uh, in, in general, I think the README is kind of your way to advertise your code. Yeah. Because so, is, yeah, first impression. Um, we have a few fun exercises for README files. And I think we should take a little bit of time to. So, we have already talked a lot about what is required, but we should t spend a little bit of time playing around with it. Um, so let's do the exercise one um, as a demonstration. Um, but for that, we need a readme on GitHub. So in the next section, we'll use this um, documentation example, um, but I will also use it in this readme example. And if we open the readme file here, we'll see that it's written in Markdown. Um, GitHub nicely renders Markdown automatically. So what are these things? Um, there's some more information about um, what, um, what kinds of formatting you can use here. But um, let's try make a note. 
So if I if I copy the whole thing, it maybe it doesn't copy these ticks. Let's see. So what is each of these things? No, it does copy the ticks. Oh, because the ticks are part of the markdown language. Right. Markdown. Okay, so the first thing is a note. Um, it will do some fancy formatting. The second is important. And one thing you can do if you're editing it on GitHub is you can preview. So let's see what it looks like. Okay, so there is a blue um, information thing. There is a um, slightly more red and um, well, I guess yellowish, but red, more visible uh, version of it. Okay, so that's a fun thing you can do. What is this details and summary? Hmm. I guess this is some kind of card section. So let's try this. So if you add this details tag, um, and it has a summary on top, short summary. Oh, okay. So details is something that's hidden by default, but it has a title. And then when you click on it, it expands. So this is useful for making the readme more readable, but still you can include some, uh, some additional information that people might need. Okay, and then there's some patches. So um, a lot of projects have these um, automatically updating patches that fetch some information like is the documentation up to date and building correctly? Um, or do the tests currently pass in this branch and so on. So this format creates some sort of a batch. Um, this is uh, from image.shields.io. So it builds you um, this, um, well, this image with the text that you put in. Which is essentially the, ad uh, well, the address that you use converted into text. Yeah. So this is also a link uh, that goes to example.org in this case. But um, there's a, there would be a lot more realistic cases for using this. So, um, so you can use a batch, for example, to show, well, like I said, that uh, the documentation is co correctly compiling. Um, Which would probably come from a different source because that commonly yeah. comes from some kind of uh, continuous integration or a system that tells you, okay, it actually built properly and so on. Okay, so we should go on a break soon. Let's take an example, read me quickly. Um, so we can find something on GitHub. Um, do you have an example in mind that has some batches and what other useful features we would want to see. Um, um, no. Let's look at um, NumPy is the one that always comes to my mind when I think of a Python project. And go for NumPy, I think that's fine. Okay, so NumPy is a huge project. You have to scroll down a bit to get to the, um, to the readme file. So the batches are on top. There's a DOI um, that links to the digital object identifier of the software. There's a Stack Overflow page for NumPy where you can ask questions um, and it shows how many downloads per month they've had. Um, and an open SSF. Um, I'm not actually sure what this is, some sort of um, score. So you might have something like um, the coverage of tests and uh, or whether the tests are passing is one I mentioned. All sorts of um, useful at a glance information in there. And then they have everything you need to know about NumPy right on top. Code of conduct and how to contribute or call for contributions in this case. Um, and yeah, so these are the most important things. Um, in the documentation itself, um, actually this one, this readme already tells you how to install. Does it tell you how to install it? Well, it has a pipe high, 
to activate. It doesn't really tell you how to install it. Okay, fine. Um, it tells you how to test the something, test that it runs correctly. Um, so here's the documentation page though. And let's go to the web version. So there's a getting started section. There's some a user guide. There's the API reference and how to contribute. So there's a, of the more, most important parts are quickly, quickly there. There's installation instructions and uh, links to important things like issue tracker is where you uh, report bugs, for example, and support Q and A. Okay, so maybe I should still quickly show what an API reference looks like. So this is, um, I want a function. Well, let's just do infinity. So somewhere in the code, they define this numpy.infinity, uh, which represents an infinite number. And there they have a doc string that's essentially converted into this section of the documentation. Okay, so I think that's um, enough of that example. Um, and let's take a break before we go to the next section. So I would say at least until five past, then we'll, we should have plenty of time. Sounds good. All right, so see you at five past, bye. Hello, we are back. Um, hope you had a good break. Um, there was a question about the repository that I showed. I didn't actually save the changes, but um, that's actually um, the template. Uh, that, that's a repository that we're going to use in this next demonstration anyway. So I will show it in a moment. Um, sorry, it, we don't use it in this one. We use it in the next one. So let me just quickly hop over to that just to answer the question that I started to answer. So there is this um, documentation example uh, repository uh, that allows you to generate an example for that we will be using today. Um, and what I showed was actually a, a generated from this documentation example. So um, it's something that I will delete in um, after this course is over, but you can also generate an example from here. Um, we will, it will be more important later what the contents are, but of course, for the thing that I showed, um, it was mainly that it has a readme file. Okay, so Sphinx and Markdown. Um, so yeah, we mentioned that Sphinx is the thing we use to generate these course materials. Um, and they are large part written in Markdown. Um, and you, you, you can also use rich text in um, a, a rich text with Sphinx that is probably the default, but um, it's also easy to use Markdown. Um, and since you're all used to Markdown by now, because all the notes are in Markdown, we will use that. Okay, so this is mainly a demonstration, so I will soon move into the, um, the Visual Studio window. But you can also try to do this probably better um, to just follow along for now, but you can also try to do this in a project of your own or just you following these steps. Um, so I will just expand this window a bit. Okay, so... Um, the instructions start with some um, checks that everything is working as expected. So Swinx runs in Python, so we need to have Python. We do have Python. Um, I will just quickly run through this. Just that we don't run into problems while doing the demonstration. Um, so we need Sphinx build. Whoops, I clicked on Sphinx build and now I'm no longer copied. I have no longer copied what I was expecting. So, okay, Sphinx quick start is um, it's a script that we will use. It has the correct version, everything's fine. 
Um, and one important thing that if you need to install separately is this mist parser. So for for this to work, you need both Sphinx, uh, Python, Sphinx, and Sphinx pass, uh, mist parser. Um, so mist is the kind of markdown we will be using. Okay, so let's get started. So right now we are in an empty repost, uh, empty uh, folder. So there's nothing in here. Um, I will make a new directory. I'll actually use the file view for that. New folder. Doc example. And then in, in there, we, okay, we need to go in that folder and then run Sphinx quick start in that folder. So let's go there to documentation example um, and then run Sphinx quick start right here. Okay, maybe I need a bit more space for this. Okay, so um, it asks you a few questions. Um, uh, let's say I don't want to separate the directories now. Um, it's usually best to just stick with the standard, uh, with the defaults. Um, project name is something we of course need. Um, this is only a test project. Let's call it that. Or should we have a funny name for it? I'm not great with funny names. I will not start because then I will not be able to continue. Okay. Um, authors names, that's my name. Um, project release. So that's the version number, let's say. That's 0.0.1. Um, and language, let's do English. So it will support English and no other languages um, by default. Okay. So now we have a bunch of new files here. So uh, Sphinx re a quick start created all the files that Sphinx needs to run um, in this folder. There's this uh, conf.py, which has all the configuration for this um, for this project. There's uh, all the project name, um, copyright statement, author's name, version number. And then we have some um, extensions that you can add. Um, and we will in fact add one since we are here, why not do it now? So um, we want to add this mist parser extension here. Okay, and that's probably the only thing we want to change in this, in this file. Um, let's look at the other files. So, so okay, conf.py has the configuration options uh, for Sphinx. Then we have an index.rst, which is the main file for this documentation. It's an rich text file. Um, oh, sorry, Thomas, did you say something? Or... No, I, I okay. wouldn't call it the main, it's the root file. Okay, yeah, the root file. Um, so in this case, it has a title and then it has a, um, a talk tree. So um, um, a table of table contents. Content. Yes, um, and then it, you can define some indices in here that um, it will use to generate the uh, the page or the, or the um, documentation pages. Okay, the make file and make.bat um, are something you use to actually build the documentation. So they're workflow files. Um, we don't we don't want to, uh, we don't need to go into the details of, of what's in there because it will look pretty complicated. Um, and it's essentially anything else. Old, you never modify. Yeah. Okay, so there's a empty build directory, an empty static directory, an empty templates directory. So the build directory will, um, it's where Sphinx puts things that um, it creates. So you generally don't put anything in there. Um, templates is for your own HTML templates. Um, I yeah, we will not be creating any of those in this example. Um, and static is for static files for the HTML side, like images um, or CSS for uh, styles and, and so on. So mainly images are the ones you will run into first. Those will go into the static folder. Okay, 
So let's look at the index. Um, so we will not use this indices and tables section, so we can remove it. And then, um, okay, so this section here is a comment in um, rich text. So this will not be displayed on the website. Let me show the whole thing. So yeah, so it just it, it states that it's the, the master file created by Sphinx Quick Start. Okay, um, then we have this table of contents, um, max depth of the table, so how many, um, like if, if, uh, if a file contains sections, like how deep do you want to go in those sections? And then um, in here, we can add our own pages. Oh, sorry, let me disable that because it is going definitely going to make things um, weird for what we want to do here. Um, okay, so um, should actually probably have locked out of everything. Okay, so here we go. So we can add a page into a documentation. So some feature dot markdown. Um, this is a file name and that file doesn't exist yet. So um, so we need to add it, but um, it will, once we add it, it will be in the table of documentation, uh, table of contents. Okay, so let's add that file. Let's call it some feature.md. And then we can start adding things here. So what, um, this is now markdown. So it should look relatively familiar by this point. Um, it has a um, had it has a title. It has a subsection title, some normal text, and uh, some a list and some nested items in that list. Okay, and I need to also save this one. Okay, and now going back to the terminal. Um, I could probably run something in VS Code as well um, to to run this, but um, well, let's just run it in the terminal, follow the instructions to the letter. Um, so what we run is Sphinx build, and then we give it the directory that we want to the where the um, where the input files are in, which is this current directory. So dot, and then where do we want to put all the um, all the build files and that's the underscore build directory. Okay, there's a warning, non-existent. Some, it didn't find some feature. Okay, so did I do something wrong? There's um, some. There's a typo. There's a... If I'm... Oh no, wait. Some feature so did you create, did you create the MD? Yes, this is some feature dot MD. Is it in the right folder? Okay, it should be. No. No, it's not. True. This is in right. So <laughs> I originally opened um, the folder one above this one, and then created this folder. Okay, so it was in the wrong folder. It's a uh, slightly unintended. Okay, let's try again. So I'll go to the terminal and run the same command again by pressing up arrow. There we go. And there it was. Right. Um, am I sharing the entire terminal window now? Uh, I think there are many, might be well, cutting no, off it, a little it, bit no, of it, the bottom. It's, it's actually complete. Um, okay. It just looks odd because it's line breaking. Um, uh, no, I mean, I think the last thing I'm seeing in the stream is this line. Ah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. okay, I've updated it. Yeah. So you, the command I just ran is this things build dot and then underscore build. Okay. So mostly it was visible just uh, when it reads the end of the, the last line, then you maybe didn't see it. Okay, but here we are. Um, it's a little bit wider as well.
Okay. So um, now we should have the files. It didn't complain about anything. And now in this build directory, um, this is what we had previously. And now we have, um, well, we have some HTML files, importantly, an index.html. So we can open that in a web browser and see what's inside. Um, so there's a different ways of doing that from the terminal. Um, I think in this case, we can try to do this in VS Code. We can go live on the live server. Um, the problem is that it will open the folder that's at the bottom of the, um, but well, it will open the, the folder that's currently open in um, VS Code. In VS Code. So this font is really small. Okay, now it's really big. So yeah, that's the build directory. And finally, okay, so now it opened the actual documentation page. So this is what the default looks like. Uh, it's a table of contents, there's some feature and a subsection. And then there's this navigation area. Okay, so let's go to some feature. And this is the this is now the page we wrote in Markdown for this some feature section. Okay, so how are we doing? We are actually, we haven't spent all that much time here yet. So let's do a bit more. So um, we can go and edit the some feature dot markdown and try some um, try some more fancy features of the missed markdown. Okay, so maybe not as that fancy, but there's some um, different levels of titles, which we are already seeing. Um, so there's level one. Um, level two. So this will look slightly different once we run, oh, oops, that's still level two with three of these um, hashes, it will be level three and with four hashes, it will be level four. Okay, so these are, this will look slightly different actually. Why not, um, why not just keep recompiling and show as we go? Okay, so this is what the different levels of titles look like. Um, it, there's a useful feature here. So there is a permalink to each of these heading, each of these sections. Um, so when you say um, hash, then the section title, it will take you directly to that section in the documentation. Okay. So what else can you do? You can do numbered lists. Um, so let's do three items, but now we don't actually have to keep numbering the items correctly. You can make edits and um, sometimes the numbers come out or sometimes you forget to change the numbers, but um, but the markdown renderer takes care of that for you. So the numbers will come up correctly in this case. Yeah, as expected, okay. Okay, then some other things you can do and you can also test this in the notes. Um, maybe don't add two large tables into the notes, <laughs> but okay, this is what a table looks like. So you need to have a header and a line below the header and then the renderer will realize that this is supposed to be a table. Okay, so this is a table of whether each number is prime. I'm always a bit confused about why one is not a prime, but fine. Two is a prime. Maybe one is a prime, what do you think? 
let's also add a bit of spacing there just to so one useful thing of course in markdown is that um the text written into um the text document itself usually looks good enough on its own so you don't even need to render it to see um to be able to read it properly but this creates a table. So four is not a prime, which is good to know. Um, and then, well, you can have, importantly in software documentation, you can have code. Um, so this is Python code. So we'll start with three ticks and then the language name, so Python. So let's just do a quick function. Let's say hello world or just hello. And this function prints hello world. Okay. So that's an example of how to include code in um, in Markdown I and I will language. Yeah, in a certain language. So I will quick also uh, just copy paste in an example from uh, that's written in C so that you see there's multiple languages. I just didn't write to write all of this <laughs> C code um, in, into the markdown file. Okay. Um, because there's, there's a lot of, um, a lot more you need to do in C to get the same result. Okay. You can also, include a file directly. So this is literal include directive. So it's the same three ticks and then literal include and the name of the file. Um, there was the question um, if we can give a bit more explanation of what you can configure and so on, what you can do. And I think um, mm. going through the conf.py uh, a bit would be useful okay probably. yeah um let's see so there's one more thing so we don't have an example.py um so this will not actually work um so let's get rid of this section but one more thing before that so you can also write math equations which is important in many fields so this is a math section and this is something that the specifically missed flavored markdown does for you I so think that's also for the literal include that's also missed oh yeah okay that is true um we do do need to do something in the conf.py to get this to work so we'll be there in a second so we'll just write um this very interesting equation pythagorean theorem okay and you can also do an inline equation So again, math in, um, it's not square brackets, what are these called? Um, curly brackets. Curly brackets, okay. Okay, so that's an inline equation. Okay, and so, um, okay, this will actually not work. No? Let's see. I'm quite surprised. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it mentions that in, in some older versions of Sphinx, uh, you needed to include it. Um, okay, so yes. Like so this this Sphinx is, is so now now this is included in Sphinx or with the missed password extension directly. We don't need um, to change the config file for this to work. Let's oh. change the config file anyway. Um, so here's the config file. So um, there's not that much here actually. Um, that's where to look for HTML templates um, well, and what files to not theme. include. Yeah, we can do that. Yes. Um, I don't know what the defaults are. Um, what well, are good you ones? Could use the things RTD. I think that should be part of the code foundry environment. Mm, okay, let's do that. So is it Sphinx RTD or? I Read the so. docs RTD, yes. 
Let's see if this works. No. Okay, so we don't have that one. So that that failed. Uh, it's Sphinx RTD uh, underscore RTD underscore theme. Sphinx Redox theme with underscores. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that works. So yeah, this looks a lot nicer, doesn't it? Um, this looks pretty much like our. Uh, yeah. uh, our course documentation, which is yeah. built on this as well. OK. Um, it's half past, so yeah, OK, we, we are doing um, good time. So um, I mean, in principle, there's a lot you can change. Um, but a lot of it is not in the default configuration options here. So you have HTML templates, so you can write any HTML file you want and include the contents in that Sphinx creates into that. Um, there's also a number of these themes that you can use and you can install um, the third party themes as Python packages. So um, there is a lot you can do. Um, But yeah, so I don't know if there's anything we can easily demonstrate here in the time we have. I think the theming is probably the easiest that we have done that. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, we, we, we could build this example.py file to um, show what, uh, what how it actually works and just add a example.py. Yes, add uh, this literal include section uh, it also specifies the language and we are putting emphasis on lines two and three here so we don't know what those lines are yet because we didn't create the file yet lines two and three that means if i'm importing something um it will probably be those lines So those are the lines we were emphasizing, and then we do something. I think that's already sufficient. Yeah. OK, so that's some Python code. Um, and let's build. And your example of Pi is again in the wrong folder. True. Let's move it to the right folder. OK, good. Thanks for noticing that. OK, so now it's um, including the example code directly, and um, it's added some emphasis on these two lines. And that's pretty convenient if you, especially in our case, um, where we sometimes have examples that build on one another, and we just want to highlight what changed in between the previous and yeah. this, this piece of code. So that's something that's quite useful there. Um, and of course, this is a way of including the same example in multiple different places, for example. Okay, so we did the math. Um, we did the, so we, we did not add, um, the one thing we didn't add is uh, API documentation. And we have talked a good bit about that. So maybe we should do that one as well before moving on to the next part. One thing I want to mention is that this is also a nice way to, uh, in general, present examples and keep the examples as actual runnable files. So you, I think you can even do literal, or you can do literal includes that only include certain lines and don't, um, not just highlight, but just uh, only yeah. include the yeah. specific lines that you want to show. But you essentially have the example files as whole scripts or whatever. Mm. Um, which makes it, uh, well, more usable in the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So um, because often you write a tutorial with some code examples, but it's hard to 
write that in such a way that the code examples actually work and actually run. It is hard to test those code examples. But if you instead include certain lines from a script, you can always run the script and see that it actually works. OK, so um, I uh, deleted the script-like part that I added. But instead, now I'm adding this multiply function. And importantly, this function has um, in it, ha it has in-code documentation. It has an API reference. So um, this is now the our code for this project. And we want to have an API reference added to our documentation. We don't currently have one. Um, so how do we do that? Um, we First, we need to go back to this index.rst file. And we will be documenting the example module uh, example.py here. So let's just call it the subsection example. Um, let's actually add a whole main section API reference. OK. Um, I assume the example will have we will work, but this is this looks a lot like Markdown and RSD are getting mixed together. So we'll see. <laughs> it looks suspicious. OK. So this is another of these uh, tree tick sections. Um, we'll call this eval RST. Um, I am very much starting to think that I'm doing something wrong here. No, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, this is already RST. So why don't I just have an RST section directly like this? Ah, uh, yeah, but then you then you can't use the the hashtags for the type uh, for titles. The AP reference. Yes, um, but well, this title is already in RST. Uh, it's this this title is already in rich, rich text. So yeah, why not do it this way? Okay, so let's have an example of how to do titles in rich text instead. So this is a big title, and this is a small one. Um, I think level one and level zero, mm -hmm. oh, level level one and level two. Um, OK, so um, this will be auto module example. So module, in this case, is a Python module. It's this example module here. And then some magic words, members. So we include all of the members everything that's in um, example.py. Mm -hmm. OK, and now, now we, we do need to go and change the configuration file, conf.py. Um, you need to add the Sphinx X to autodoc extension. Here we need to add an extension, autodoc extension. We need to make some other changes as well. Yeah. So there is an. Uh, auto doc in extension that generates this API documentation. Um, the rest of this stuff, I think, maybe goes on top. But below this first comment, maybe, yeah, on top. So we need to import some things. What we essentially need to do uh, is we need to inform things on where this can be found. And yeah. um, that's what we're doing here, we from OS, we are getting the path we are currently on. And uh, this allows us to set the path Python is looking for code yeah. in. So if you are not familiar with Python, this you can think of this as a magic expression, but then you put whatever your source path is in here. So our source path is the current directory, so we just use dot. OK, um, should it run now? I think it should run. I think it should. In a normal um, Python, uh, well, in a normal Python project, you would probably have something like source in here and not. Talk. Yeah, or uh, the Python package name. You know what I did incorrectly here? I just added it direct, this section directly to the uh, index yeah, of RST an and not as yeah, a, sec yeah, a separate file. That's why I got confused doesn't hurt too much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
okay so it should build build example imp build import module uh, example no module named my project okay so what is happening right um, I still have these lines that don't work in my code yeah I should be importing something else okay so yeah now it should work as long as I have numpy available which I think you have and let's do some proper formatting there okay now it works Okay, so now let's go back to the main page. And here we have the API documentation directly in the main page, which is not uh, not the best <laughs> not thing. Not optimal. So... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, normally but, you would do this yeah. um, in a- Yeah, normally it would be a separate section here. Yeah. In a separate file. Okay, but it's- um, we have a limited amount of time. It would not be that complicated to fix this, but it works already. So let's um, keep it as it is. Okay, so that was the Sphinx and Markdown example. There's a lot of stuff there you can play around with. You can try doing this yourself, either with the example or with your own project. Um, are people confused about Mist and Markdown and restructured text? Um, not a huge number of questions yeah. in the notes. So I guess we're fine. Um, well, there's a bit more yeah, information questions. here. Write them in the, in the yeah. uh, collaborative document. Yeah. Um, we can come to them uh, later or they can be answered in the document as well. One useful thing uh, to mention that often saves me and often I forget to do and, and therefore get into trouble is uh, there is a way of checking links in this uh, generated documentation. Um, so at, at least if the links just don't work at all, um, this will help you. If they lead in the wrong place, it might not save you, but it, it's, a, it's a very common <laughs> issue to um, add wrong or incorrect links. So this is useful. Okay. Let's then head on to the next section. So GitHub pages um, and how to deploy Sphinx documentation to GitHub pages. So this is again using GitHub um, and GitHub is not the only option, but it is a um, common and uh, easy option. So since basically everything we have is on GitHub, we will demonstrate using GitHub. Um, so we will be using two things, GitHub pages, which is a way of including uh, websites essentially in your repository and uh, showing them as HTML files, as, um, as websites instead of the source code. Um, and uh, GitHub actions, which, is, which are things that run automatically when you push something to your repository. So this is a really useful thing in general. We'll see an example of. Okay. So um, yeah, this is pulling a lot of stuff from the past two weeks um, and putting it all together. So we'll just go into it and see how it goes. Okay. So um, there is this documentation example repository and I already made a um, made my own version of this documentation example. Uh, so it's generated from this template as it says here. Um, and at this point, I should have the instructions available for me. Okay, just a small moment. Here we are. Um, so um, this, is on, this is a repository that contains it's it's already on GitHub, but it contains essentially what we just did. So there's a documentation folder in this repository. It has um, a conf.py from Sphinx for Sphinx and all of this other stuff. That is uh, some feature dot markdown that we just created. Um, it is very familiar looking. Um, 
and then there's a source folder for our actual software. It's actually an empty folder that just has a readme file that says this is where your code would go. Um, so yeah, this is an example. Okay, so um, we could clone this um, locally and do what we just did to build the documentation, but instead we're going to do it with a workflow file. So we will add a new file. Is the, um, is the text too small? That may be slightly problem. better. Okay, yeah, so let's create a new file. And this needs to go into dot github slash workflows. And now we can choose whatever name we want for the work, workflow. So let's call it documentation. And it's a YML file, a YAML file. Okay, so this is something I would rarely type out. Um, basically never, I just always get an example from somewhere and change the parts that need changing. But the syntax is not that complicated. So um, a workflow has a name, documentation. Uh, when do we want to run it? So we run on um, a push, a pull request, so if somebody makes a pull request, we want to run this documentation uh, builder and then workflow dispatch. This means that we can manually ask this workflow to run, which is useful for an example. Okay, permissions. So it, it needs, so the idea is that it work, this workflow will build our documentation and then put it in our repository in a branch. And then that branch is our website. So it needs the permission to write into our, um, into our repository. So let's give it write permissions to the contents of the repository. Okay. And then we'll define a job for this workflow to run. Um, so there's a job step called docs. And this will run on. So you need to tell it what operating system you want your job to run on. Ubuntu. Um, that's the simplest option for me. And then we define some steps to run. Okay. So at this point, um, maybe I will quickly tell you what each step does, but I will not write out the details. So first we need to uh, check out or clone our repository. And then we need to install Python because Sphinx runs in Python. Then we need to install some dependencies and that is a, um, piece of code we run ourselves we write ourselves so this step install dependencies runs a piece of code which is pip install and the dependencies we need okay am i now on the same level as the name yes okay then we want to build the documentation so it also runs a command. It runs the Sphinx build command. Um, the document, the source for the documentation is the doc folder and the build folder is where the documentation goes. Now, importantly, the build folder will not appear in our repository. It's not modifying our repository at this point. It's just running on some random machine in the cloud and creating a build folder. So we need to copy it somewhere where other people can see it. So deploy to GitHub pages. Um, now, what does this do? Um, this runs a workflow someone else wrote for us um, that actually does the deployment, but we need to give it some parameters and, um, well, okay, before we give it the parameters, we only want it to run if the push is to the main, if something gets pushed to the main branch. 
So this looks a bit complicated. It is a bit complicated, but what it does, it, it prevents this from publishing documentation that's in the wrong branch, that's in a, um, a pull request, for example. So also only documentation in the main branch gets pushed to the, uh, gets uh, updated to the, the actual documentation. Okay, and then some parameters. Publish it to a branch called GitHub Pages. Um, it needs a secret token to actually modify the repository. And um, well, that's the, that's where it should find the uh, built documentation. Okay, so a good number of steps here, um, but each of them in principle is hopefully something uh, that's uh, familiar to you by now. Um, so we are cloning a repository, uh, installing Python, installing dependencies, building the documentation. And the last thing is new, we are uh, pushing it to a new branch in our existing repository. Okay, now um, I have a new file. I want to commit this to GitHub. Actually, this is a pretty good commit message. Um, to build and publish documentation. Okay, and I'll just push directly to the main branch in this case. I'm the only one working on this project. Okay. Here we go. Now we have a new workflow file. Okay. Well, did anything happen? <laughs> Not really. Um, yes, that did. It is something did happen. It is already running. So the, the um, workflows are already set to run in this repository. They are automatically set to run. As soon as you have any workflows being set up, they will run. Okay. That's nice. Um, there's a workflow that hasn't completed yet, but we can look at the details from here. So this is all the steps we just defined. And now it is done. No, it is done. Okay. So it, it prints some output at each step. It's installed Python, Sphinx build and so on. Um, okay. So what did it do? It created a new branch. Oh, that's still yellow. Maybe I need to just refresh the page. Now it's, yeah, it's a nice uh, green tick. So everything's working. Uh, it created a new branch called GitHub pages, which is here. And now this has this index.html and everything that's needed for the website. That's essentially a copy of the build directory as we yeah. specified in our... Okay. Code. I would assume that it's not working as a page yet though. I need to go to settings. Yeah, at it's least not deployed as a page yet. Yeah. Um, so, so if I go to settings, there's a pages section here, and here I can select deploy from a branch. Um, and the branch I want to deploy from is GitHub Pages, GH Pages. Okay, and the root of that branch. Save the settings. Okay, and now if I go to, so the the URL is slightly different from this um, repository URL, but it's related. So I need to go to um, my username, .github.io, and then the name of the repository. Okay, and here we are. So now my documentation is online. Um, anyone can go to this address and see it. Actually, one very useful thing to do after this would be to take this URL and edit the readme file and add some sort of link to it in here. I will do the simplest possible job of adding the link here, but um, you might want to format it slightly better. Add a link to documentation in readme. Okay. So now we have, uh, I guess, the, um, 
I made a mistake in uh, Markdown syntax here. Okay, so now we have a link to the documentation in our uh, README and it will get updated automatically. So now I did a new push, it's rebuilding the documentation. Although even though there wasn't any change to the documentation, it's um, always when I change anything in this repository, it will rebuild and publish again. So okay. Also, um, you can also, which people very often do, um, put it into your into the about. Um, um, yes. So it's not the about section is not visible now. If I make it a no, bit smaller, so here is an about section. So if you click on that uh, cogwheel in the top right yeah. corner, ah, that's the website the URL. Okay. Or use your GitHub Pages website. Which will point to the correct one, even if you change the name of the repository. You can also add a description here. Um, example of building documentation. Uh, okay, now that's updated. So now there's a link to the documentation right here in the sidebar for anyone who's uh, looking at the at your repository. Um, after this is the lunch break, right? So we have five more minutes. Um, we definitely don't want to start on the next section, which is um, how to publish your own website in GitHub pages. Um, it is quite similar to this one and you can check it out on your own. Um, I guess the, the biggest difference is that we're not automatically building the documentation. Uh, we're not automatically building the website. We are uh, only publishing it on GitHub pages. Um, yeah, well, I, I did mention there's a bunch of, there are alternatives. Um, there's GitLab, GitLab, CI GitLab is a common alternative to GitHub. Um, and GitLab pages, read the docs is commonly used. Um, and well, those are the alternatives we mentioned here, I guess. Um, there's, Essentially, all the repo all the places where you can host your repositories, almost all of them also have a way of hosting um, a static website, and, because and it is actually just HTML code. Yeah, which you could also <clears> host <throat> on whatever other server or web server you have. Um, yeah, you yeah. that you in some way control and just point it to. Okay, this is the yeah. static website. Yeah, true. Um. GitHub pages or right. GitLab pages is just a very simple way to have a web hoster for you that you don't so, have to explicitly pay. So we will skip over the hosting websites and home pages on GitHub and go to the summary. And probably the best way of doing this would be to ask everyone if you have any questions, please ask them in the notes and see if there's anything interesting there. And I think or anything both... important, uh, anything very important to um, to bring up. Right. I think the first point um, in the summary is actually quite important. There is not the one right way to do things uh, in documentation, and it. I would uh, add to that. It's in general more important to have some documentation um, than to have a perfect documentation. Yeah. Yeah, this is a typical case of um, better have something incomplete than not having anything at all. When um, if you feel this went too fast, or you just want to um, learn this better to um, to actually use this on your own repository, um, the instructions are on the course website or on this uh, the website for this section. So I essentially followed this um, deploying Sphinx documentation to GitHub almost exactly. So just yeah, take a look there and the Sphinx and Markdown section where you can set up your documentation first. Um, but yeah, so there's always the a. So 
um, a balance you need to find with how much time you spend writing documentation versus how much time you spend coding and how much time you spend doing research and other things in your life. So for smaller projects, a readme file can co easily contain everything you need, especially if you have in-code documentation as well. Um, something that takes that in-code documentation and turns it into a, an API reference is nice. Um, and you can do that very quickly with Sphinx, even if you don't write any other documentation in there. Um, but that, yeah, that, that's um, a small step further. And then in a bigger project, you will have um, a full-fledged website with um, lots of examples and so on. So it depends on, um, practically speaking, how much time you have to spend on, on this. And um, you want, of course, to spend time actually writing your code as well, and not just documentation. So there is a balance there. In most projects, just a readme is enough because most projects are small. Yeah. And yeah, you, you can essentially put all the examples also just in the readme if it's a really small project. Even even kind of API definitions you can put in the readme in a small project and you don't need to set up a whole yeah. Sphinx environment for it. Okay, but it is time to go for lunch break. Um, after the lunch break, we will have a section on Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so anyone who is around, do you want to do a quick outro or, or um, a quick Maybe. teaser of what's after the lunch break? Um, Jupyter Notebooks are a really useful tool for research. So um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess many people know Jupyter in general. Here we go over just a little bit of the basics in case anyone doesn't know. But more important than that, we talk about how to make them a little bit more reproducible, like some ways of sharing them, which perhaps you didn't know about. Ways of diffing and merging them, using them with version control and so on. So basically, it will help you go from using them and a big mess to using them and a little bit more organized and closer to regular code. So with that, should we go to lunch? Yeah. So, OK. We will see you later then. Enjoy your lunch. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.